All right, so having have a look at those factors in the general environment, that segment or that part of the organization's external environment. The next part that we're going to look at is the industry environment and the analysis that goes with that. This, as you can imagine, uh, is has even more of a direct effect on the firm. Um, it, it's those factors and forces that specifically uh, are able to influence and also potentially this time be influenced by the firm, whereas those previous general environment segments, we don't have a lot of control over them as a company. In the industry environment, these factors we do potentially have some influence over. Uh, the first thing you need to do as part of your industry environment analysis is work out what your industry is. Now, in terms of the definition, we can define it as a group of firms that produce similar products or offer similar services that are close substitutes. There is no necessarily one best way or one way that you have to do your industry definition, but it will be really important um, how you define your industry will not only determine your competitors, but also how you then go about doing your analysis. Compared with the general environment, as we've said, the industry environment has a more direct effect on a firm's strategic competitiveness and its ability to make money, basically. Um, the industry's profit potential and therefore its overall attractiveness is best explained by Porter's Five Forces model. Now, you might have remembered Porter from his uh, American friend who also devised the uh, the value chain and a few other important concepts we use throughout this semester. If you ever wondered what Mark, good old Michael Porter looks like, there he is in the top right of your screens. He might be an American who's never seen an AFL game in his life, but he does love the Saints, as you can see there, by his ev as evidenced rather by his St Kilda scarf. He's a member of 2015. Good on him. He said there are five competitive forces within it each industry that we can look at and states that the stronger each of these forces is, the more limited the ability of the companies who are in that industry already to earn above average returns. That's a key point here, that when we're analysing our industry environment, these forces are considered from the perspective of a company that is already in that industry. The model that, he, that Michael Porter proposed looks something like this. He titled it the Five Forces Model of Competition. Uh, not surprisingly, given there are these five factors that you need to consider, uh, and we'll go through each of these one by one and how they influence the overall attractiveness and profit potential of an industry. The first is the threat of new entrants, and this is, not surprisingly, has to do with how easy or difficult it is for companies that are not already in the industry to enter into that industry. High entry barriers tend to increase the returns for existing firms in an industry and may allow some firms to dominate that particular industry. Entry barriers we're going to talk about in a little bit. They're a very important concept to understand with our Portals Five Forces analysis. Industry incumbents want to maintain high entry barriers in order to discourage potential competitors from entering the industry. Now, as I say, the overall threat of new entrants is a function of, of two factors. The expected retaliation uh, of the existing firms, that is, if you're a firm looking to enter into a particular industry, if you expect that your entry will uh, create a significant reaction from the existing companies, often engaging in things like price wars and so on, making your life more difficult when you enter into the market, that will probably discourage you from entering into that particular industry. So the expected retaliation of those existing firms will influence how likely new entrants are to enter the market. But the most important factor are the barriers to entry or these entry barriers. These are any things that make it more difficult for a, a new firm to enter into an industry. So the economies of scale, a lot of industries have, you need to be able to manufacture something in high quantities in order to make money out of it and to spread those costs over the large quantity of whatever it is that you produce. If a company is not able to produce whatever it is that they manufacture in such large quantities, that will represent a barrier to entry. The capital requirements, a lot of industries like the airline industry, it simply requires so much money to set yourself up as a business that that often deters firms as well on its own. Uh, the access to distribution channels, a lot of the time we think of the car industry again here. Um, it's one thing for me to be able to make cars, but if you're a car manufacturer, you need to set up a dealership network where you can actually sell them. And that takes a lot of time and money and would put off a lot of companies as well. The cost the disadvantage is independent of scale. Therefore, uh, the government policy is a key one 
as well, that a lot of the time, especially entering into foreign markets, it, that will be made more difficult for the new firms because the government will have set up uh, policies and laws which basically prohibit them or at least make it difficult for them to enter into a particular industry. So this is the first of the factors that will influence how attractive an industry is. The second is the bargaining power of suppliers. Basically, when you are doing negotiations with your suppliers in an, in in an industry, do they hold the upper hand or is it you who has the power over them in those negotiations? Supplier power increases when suppliers are large and few in number. Obviously, if they are a massive supplier and there aren't many other suppliers that you have to choose from, then they're going to have a fair bit of power over you. If there are suitable substitute products that are not available, that is, if what they are offering you as a supply input uh, cannot be substituted by anything else, then again, they will have power over you. When industry firms are not a significant customer for the suppliers, that is, when they don't, as a supplier, rely on you as a firm, then they're going to have the upper hand there. Suppliers goods, or when suppliers goods are critical to buyers' marketplace success, that is, if they supply you with a crucial input, potentially even the thing that creates a source of competitive advantage for your firm, then again, they are going to have the upper hand in those negotiations because they can say, well, if you uh, don't agree to our terms, then we will not supply you with this thing which gives you your competitive advantage. When the effectiveness of suppliers' products creates high switching costs, uh, and also when the supplier poses a credible threat of integrating forward into the buyer's industry. That is when they become so big and powerful that uh, if you don't agree to their terms in these negotiations, they have the ability to say to you as a firm, well, we're going to stop just being a supplier. We're going to go actually into your industry and not just be a supplier, we'll be a manufacturer and you will lose a supplier and gain a competitor. Obviously, that is not what we want as a company. So that, again, is a situation where they would have power over us. Obviously, for us as a firm, the lower their bargaining power is, the better it is for us. On the other hand, we also have the bargaining power of buyers. This is, again, as you might imagine, when the buyers have power over us in any negotiations. Now this power is going to increase when the buyers purchase a large portion of an industry's total output, that is we rely on that buyer for uh, for success, if that is the case and they're going to have a large power over us. When their buyers purchases are a significant portion of a seller's annual revenue, so the same thing there. When the switching costs to other industry products are low, that is when it's easy for our buyers to simply go to another rival or competitor and buy what they are offering instead. When the industry's products are undifferentiated or standardised, again the same sort of thing that would make it easier for them to just, if they don't like our terms, then they'll just go and buy from somebody else. And also when the buyer poses a credible threat to integrate backwards into the buyer's industry. So again here, the opposite of the previous situation, this is where our buyers end up getting so big and powerful that they can say to us, well we have the ability now that we can actually manufacture it ourselves rather than relying on you to sell it, whatever it is that you're selling to us. So they're going to have power over us in that situation. The important thing to note here guys is that the buyers as such do not necessarily have to be the end consumers. Many, many industries will be selling their products to another business rather than the end consumer themselves. So there might be a dealer network, it might be a distributor, some form or third party who actually purchases our products, it will not necessarily be the end consumer. So that's an important thing to recognize there as well. The fourth of our five forces that we're going to look at here is the threat of the substitute products. Now substitute products are any goods or services from outside a given industry that perform similar or the same functions as whatever it is that we produce in that industry. So it's anything that does roughly the same job without being exactly the same. So a good example, if you are a manufacturer of trains or if you're in the train industry, trams are probably a substitute to many people in that they're not the same, there are differences, but for many people they do pretty much the same job of getting them from one place 
to another. Substitutes will place a ceiling on the prices that we as a firm can charge. Obviously, if there is something else that does the same job, then that means we won't be able to price our products as high as we'd like because if they get too high, buyers will simply switch to the lower priced substitute. The threat of substitute products increases when buyers face a few switching costs. Again, if it's easy for them to go from our product to the substitute, if the substitute product's price is lower, or the substitute product's quality and performance are equal to or higher than those of our product. Again, in that situation, buyers are likely to choose the substitute over ours. If we are able to make our products more differentiated, that is more unique and perceived as being better and different to those of the substitutes, then this will reduce the impact of the thread because they are then less likely to go, well, I can get the same thing from the substitute product. So here, we're looking for the lower the threat of substitute products, the better. The final of our five forces is the intensity of the rivalry amongst the existing competitors. What we tend to find is that most competitors are not homogenous, that is, they are not the same. They'll have differences in things like resources, capabilities, and as a result, will seek to differentiate themselves from their competitors and, and position themselves in such a way that they are, per are perceived as being better than those rivals. There are many dimensions on which rivalry may be based. Things price is obviously the most common one when you shop one product against another. A lot of the time that will be on the basis of price. The after sales service and innovation are some other common examples. We have some great examples, speaking of which, of some of the all time great rivalries here. Perhaps not quite industry level com competition, but some of our great rivals. If you haven't seen that picture, that uh, GIF on the right of your screen, if that's unfamiliar to you, do yourselves a favour and go and watch Step Brothers right after this lecture. It is going to make your life much better, I promise. The intensity of the rivalry in our industries, though, is often increased by a number of factors. First of all, if there are numerous or equally balanced competitors, then that, oh, well, obviously the more competitors, the more competition there will be, not surprisingly. If there's slow industry growth, that means that the existing competitors are going to have to fight even harder to try and gain an advantage as the, that growth in the industry slows. When there are high or fixed, uh, high fixed or storage costs rather, when companies basically have to invest and sink a lot of money into it, their effort to compete in an industry, they will usually compete quite hard and want to try and gain any advantage they can to, to gain back and to recoup those costs that they've sunk, the lack of differentiation or low switching costs again will mean that you have to fight even harder if your product is pretty much the same as that of your competitor. You're going to have to do something, usually fight even harder for the customer, to get their service. When there are high strategic stakes and high exit barriers, com companies are less willing to basically just throw in the towel and say, well, if things aren't working, we will just bail out of this industry. They will usually engage in any form of comp competition they can to try and gauge an advantage over their competitors. So again, we would prefer this to be low to increase the overall industry attractiveness, this factor here. And lastly, and this is a thing that many, many people and many, many companies miss out on and forget when they're undertaking their five force analysis. It's one thing to assess the individual strengths of each of those five forces, but to gain an overall estimate and picture of how, how attractive and profitable an industry might be, you have to add them all together. So if, for example, you identify that there are high entry barriers, weakly positioned suppliers and buyers, few uh, substitute product threats, and low or moderate rivalry, then that is going to mean you have an attractive industry overall. Obviously, if the opposite of those five conditions are true, then you'll have a less attractive industry. As I said, the key point though is to assess the overall strength by aggregating those five different forces. Only then can you truly assess the industry attractiveness and profit potential.